Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's uh, Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, please remember to fill out the attendance log, and also if you could uh, be kind enough to fill out the program evaluation, we'd appreciate that, and particularly if you could give us any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy Oksentenko. Dr. Oksentenko is board certified in internal medicine and uh, gastroenterology, and she's a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Uh, she's currently associate professor of medicine and vice chair for education in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, she's been the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, she's been extensively published, and uh, she's written 13 uh, chapters in GI textbooks, and uh, she was kind enough to uh, accept our offer to come down today and uh, discuss celiac disease. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Oxentenko. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation to come down. Can everyone hear me in the back of the room okay? Good. All right. So today we're going to spend the next hour talking about celiac disease, and I have nothing to disclose. So I'm going to start, before I go through even the objectives, just give a representative patient. And actually, this is a real patient that I saw in my clinic in the last few years. So it was a 34-year-old female who was referred for um, an evaluation and management of her irritable bowel syndrome. She was actually 16 weeks pregnant at the time of the consultation, and she reported diarrhea that began in her teens that resolved in her 20s but recurred with her current pregnancy. And on review for medication, she was taking a multivitamin. She was also taking iron and was on levothyroxine. And if you ask, she was having four to six bowel movements per day, getting up at night, but she denied any abdominal pain or cramps. And looking back, her pre-pregnancy BMI was 17, and she'd only gained five pounds of weight so far in her pregnancy. And her child was actually conceived with the use of in vitro fertilization. So I guess just, so I know I didn't set this up necessarily with an audience response system, and I have a number of questions, but I just want you to think about these questions in your mind. So which of her clinical features may be a manifestation of celiac disease? Could it be her iron deficiency, after all she's on iron, a low body mass index, her infertility, the fact that she's having nocturnal stools, or all of the above? And hopefully by the end of this, this hour, you'll realize that really any of these manifestations that she was presenting with could be a feature of celiac disease. And this lady had gone through over the years, and you can imagine every once in a while you get an, a, a dot in her record, but it's not until you put the dots together that it looks quite clear in terms of someone in their 16 week of pregnancy, usually at that point doesn't necessarily need iron already. Um, she has autoimmune disease as evidenced by her thyroid disease. She's having more bowel movements than you'd expect, even with, uh, in, in not with other conditions. Nocturnal stools would be abnormal. And the fact that she's not having abdominal pain or cramps really argues against irritable bowel syndrome. Her low weight, her low weight gain, and her in vitro fertilization all are features of celiac disease. And we'll come back to this patient. So the educational objectives of this talk are to help you identify the, the manifestations of celiac disease and how they may present to you. Understand the testing that can be utilized to screen for and diagnose celiac disease. Recognize the management plan for a patient with celiac disease, both at the time of diagnosis as well as at follow-up. And then appreciate the conditions that are associated with celiac disease that you should think about. So many of you have already, you know, are, are well versed in the definition of what celiac disease is, but it's really representing an immune response to gliadins in the diet specifically in susceptible patients, and this leads to an inflammatory state of the small bowel. We've always really thought about this as a disease of Europeans or those of European descent, and we look at, in terms of prevalence data, Finland has been one with a very high prevalence, uh, over 2%. But in North America, things have really changed, and we know that prevalence data in the U.S. really shows that celiac disease has a prevalence anywhere from 06 to 1%. So I think 1% is the number that you'll now hear frequently quoted in the literature. People who have symptoms, whether diarrhea, abdominal pain, cramps, uh, have a 1 in 50 chance of having celiac disease, and first degree relatives about a 10% chance, and we'll come back to that. You have to remember that celiac disease really now is a disease of all aged patients, and I think I'll talk about the changing face of celiac disease. We used to think this as a childhood disease, but 20% of patients or more are over age 60 at the time of diagnosis. 
and there clearly is still a, a female to male predominance of this condition. So this is really the only slide that gets into you know, physiology and science, but I think it's a helpful uh, diagram that came out in the New England Journal several years ago. It may be hard to see some of the details on the screen, but I'll use the pointer. So what happens is that a patient who's at risk ingests gluten, and these gliadins go, permeate the small bowel, and gliadins are resistant to the many proteases uh, that our small bowel and uh, gastric mucosa secretes. So what happens then are these antigen-presenting cells, which are here, and specifically the antigen-presenting cells that have either HLA, DQ2, or DQ8, which we'll talk about the significance of later, they basically present these gliadins that come in to the T cells. What happens then are the T cells recruit other immune cells. The T cells then have this gross cytokine release that damages the small bowel, leading to a lot of the histologic changes that we'll talk about that we see in celiac disease. What happens then are the tissue transglutaminases uh, that are released act on this gliadin and actually make it more antigenic to various um, immune cells, such as B cells. And then basically, there's a humoral immune response that is produced. So really, this is the mechanism of how um, of what happens in patients with celiac disease. So clearly looking at that pathogenesis, there are a lot of things going on there. We know there has to be some genetic predisposition and that you really have to have the presence of the HLA DQ2 or DQ8 on those antigen presenting cells. Clearly there needs to be gluten ingestion, but the fact that 30 to 40% of us have DQ2 or DQ8 and we all take in gluten, but we don't have celiac disease, shows us there's some other big component of this piece of the puzzle that we don't have great answers to. I'll talk about a few proposals of what's been uh, doted in the literature. So this is a, another interesting figure, I think, showing the prevalence of celiac disease worldwide and how this has changed over time. So if you look, yellow is prevalence of approximately 1%. Areas in green are 1% to 2%, and areas in red are actually greater than 2%. So areas that you might not think about as having a highly prevalent areas uh, with celiac disease. So this is really a worldwide condition. This is data also from Olmsted County, um, compliments of uh, Dr. Joe Murray, showing that really since the 1990s, there's been this takeoff in terms of incidence of celiac disease. You can see between females here, males, and overall. Now you might say, well, maybe we're just recognizing it more, we're testing more, but most of this data that's been done, not only in Olmsted County, but other places, are based on um, serum of patients that's been stored. So it's not based on newly diagnosed patients because we're recognizing it. This is based on looking at serum of patients that's been stored over 50 or more years, finding that the, uh, the incidence really started to take off in 1990s. So you could say, well, what has happened or changed over time to account for that? Again, like I mentioned, our gluten ingestion probably hasn't changed to a whole uh, great extent. Genetics probably hasn't changed a whole lot over time. What has changed is probably the way that wheat is processed, and probably our amount of wheat intake has changed over time. I think kind of the most fascinating information that's come out in recent years are other things that have shown a higher likelihood of developing uh, celiac disease. So studies have shown that anything that changes your microbiome of your gut may affect your likelihood to get celiac disease. So babies who are born of cesarean section are more likely to develop celiac disease than those born with, uh, through a vaginal delivery. Um, again, affecting somehow the microbiome that they're born into. We also know that studies have shown that when gluten is introduced uh, in infants and whether it's overlapped with breastfeeding makes a difference. And then again, any childhood or adult infections, rotavirus and other things, may affect your uh, propensity to develop celiac disease. I like this figure. This was in the New York Times a week or two ago. I don't know if any of you saw that. And it talked about the changing face of celiac disease. And in the past, when we used to think about this a number of years ago, we think of young children with failure to thrive, kind of the pro protuberant belly because of significant malabsorption, high mortality because a lot of that was not diagnosed promptly. And today we know this condition is much more common, again, affecting people of all ages, really relatively low mortality and almost nil mortality when we talk about people who are compliant on a diet. But we also know the features are very broad, and I think that's where as clinicians we need to be astute to those things. 
I think this also just shows how celiac, we're more astute to these other manifestations. And if you look back before 1981, Patients that presented with diarrhea as their manifestation of celiac disease was nine, over 90%. But if you look after the year 2000, only 37% of patients are presenting with diarrhea when they're diagnosed with celiac disease, meaning 63% are, are being diagnosed because of some other manifestation that the clinician is picking up on. I think these other statistics are, are a bit alarming in that the average number of pediatricians seen by a symptomatic child in the U.S. is eight, and an average duration of symptoms before diagnosis is made in all patients, with the exception of those who have diarrhea and fluid malabsorption, is approximately four years. So I think we have a ways to go even yet. I think this is also interesting data. Um, if you look at all patients with celiac disease that are not on are untreated, again, large population. Then you look at all of the patients who are on a gluten-free diet who have not been tested for celiac disease. And I think we'll probably see over upcoming years, this circle will be four times as large as this other circle. Um, and, and these patients all don't have celiac disease. In fact, a very small percentage of the overlap. This population represents its unique challenges that we'll talk about. But again, we have a lot of patients that are undiagnosed that we need to concentrate on. You often hear of the celiac iceberg, and that's really what those two diagrams show, a large percentage of patients that are undiagnosed in the population. And the part of the iceberg above, above surface here, these are the patients with the classic features, diarrhea, malabsorption. These other colors really represent the other features that we'll talk about, iron deficiency, metabolic bone disease, infertility. Again, I mentioned briefly the genetics of celiac disease, and I'll come back to this when we talk about testing. We know, again, that the HLA DQ2 or DQ8 is required for um, you to get celiac disease, but given 30 to 40 percent of us in the population have that, obviously that alone is not enough to, to give you celiac disease. There's some other factors, like I mentioned. These numbers, though, really show that there is a strong genetic component in that if you take monozygotic twins, if you take one twin, the other twin it has an 80% likelihood of getting celiac disease if one of the twin pairs has it. Siblings, again, a 10% likelihood if, if one sibling has it. Kids, a little bit less uh, compared to siblings. We also know that there's some genetic syndromes that are highly associated with celiac disease, and I've listed those there. So again, populations to think about if you're seeing patients with those conditions. So how to diagnose celiac disease? So this is, the, this is the important aspect for the clinician. So first of all, it's helpful if we have clinical features that are compatible. That's not always the case. Some patients are diagnosed through family screening or other measures. We like to have serologies that are supportive. That makes us feel good about the diagnosis is correct. It also gives us something to follow um, afterwards. And then we like to have small bowel biopsies that are characteristic, and really this is the gold standard for the diagnosis in combination with these other items. And then you really need to see a clinical response to a gluten-free diet. And gone are the days where you need to re-challenge a patient to re reproduce their symptoms. Um, that no longer is part of the diagnos diagnosis or the criteria to make this uh, establish a diagnosis of celiac disease. So how do patients present? Well, if you look at these, the relative size of these circles, I think this is really what you're going to see. About 50% of patients will present with a single symptom. So it could be diarrhea, it could be lactose malabsorption, so monosymptomatic. Probably a quarter of patients have classic malabsorption, diarrhea, some weight loss, um, steatorrhea, vitamin deficiencies, so multiple features of the condition. Another 25% have really kind of non-GI or extra intestinal features. Again, that's the metabolic bone disease, isolated iron deficiency, and we'll talk about those. And a very, very small percentage of patients, probably even smaller than this circle represents, can present acutely either with a, a, an acute celiac crisis or they may present with bowel obstructions because of multifocal intussusception. Again, another uh, kind of classic feature of celiac disease. So if you see a patient with intussusception, especially multifocal, think about celiac disease. So these are the manifestations of celiac disease, and the general things on the left are really the, the kind of classic features that we all think about. 
you know, the young child who is a failure to thrive, short stature, they're not meeting their developmental milestones for growth, weight loss, et cetera. I started the weight loss because it's important to know with the obesity epidemic that as of right now, at least 10% of celiac patients are obese. And so that number's gonna continue to rise. So just because a patient is in your office with diarrhea and all these other classic features, but they're obese, you still have to think about and work that patient up for celiac disease if it's fitting. Again, the GI features, classic things, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal discomfort, lack of appetite. Again, I starred constipation because about 20% of celiac disease patients report constipation as their bowel habit. So again, if you rule those patients out in your mind just because they're constipated, you're gonna miss a percentage of these patients. So something to think about. I think this is probably the most helpful table probably of this entire talk because these are the things that you really need to be aware of in your practice. These are the patients that may present with no GI symptoms but ha may have a manifestation that's listed on this chart. So anemia, especially iron deficiency anemia, is the most common extra intestinal manifestation of the disease because iron is absorbed in the small, proximal small bowel. They can also be anemic because of B12 or folate uh, malabsorption as well. So again, they could have a microcytic anemia, a macrocytic anemia. They could actually have a normal cytic anemia if they have more than one of these going on at the same time. These patients can also have functional asplenia, and we'll talk about that in, in later on in terms of management. A clue to this is if you get a peripheral smear and they have howl jolly bodies present, but they you know, still have their spleen intact, you should think about them being asplenic. Patients may have multiple vitamin deficiencies. So I think it's hard when you just see isolated vitamin D deficiency, because probably most of us in this room uh, this time of the year are relatively low on vitamin D. But again, if you connect dots and they have other features of vitamin deficiencies to think about that. We'll talk about abnormal liver biochemistries as a feature. Uh, musculoskeletal conditions. So again, osteopenia, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, these are the, the leading cause of morbidity in these patients, and we'll talk about that. There's an enteropathy-associated arthropathy, just like you might see in IBD patients. A number of neurologic manifestations. So these may, patients may present to the neurologist. Peripheral neuropathy, a gluten ataxia, seizures. Infertility, again, something to think about. Our obstetricians and gynecologists need to be aware of this association. We'll talk about the skin manifestation of this, dermatitis herpetiformis, and then I've listed some of the other things at the bottom that are less frequent, but again, things you need to think about like enamel defects, depression, fatigue, and then lactose malabsorption. This is another table that I think is helpful because again, if you see any of these, asso these associated conditions and have any features that might make you think of celiac disease, it probably is appropriate to do testing in those patients. So there's autoimmune conditions that, that are associated clearly given the auto autoimmune nature of this disease. So there's increased uh, risk in those with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, type one diabetes, and also autoimmune adrenal disease connect other connective tissue disease like rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's. Um, selective IgA deficiency is more common in celiac disease patients. Um, there's an increased likelihood of IBD, but a markedly increased uh, likelihood of microscopic colitis. In fact, celiac disease patients are upwards of 70 times more likely to have microscopic colitis than those patients in the general population. We'll talk about the hepatic conditions in a moment that are associated. There's a renal uh, uh, nephropathy associated with celiac disease, and then I also mentioned the syndromic conditions. So getting back to the iron deficiency anemia, the this, is, this is a little bit surprising. If you think about the prevalence of celiac disease patients who are presenting to you uh, for evaluation of iron deficiency anemia, if they have no GI symptoms whatsoever, there's still upwards of 9% prevalence of celiac disease in that patient. If they have any GI conditions or, or symptoms or complaints at all, that prevalence goes up to 15%, so pretty significant. We did a study a few years ago um, at Mayo, and we took all patients that were referred to endoscopy for the indication of iron deficiency anemia, and a third of those patients had other endoscopic findings that could account for iron deficiency, whether mucosal erosions in the antrum, et cetera. But a third of those patients, despite having those things, had if they would have missed the celiac diagnosis if they had not had small bowel biopsies taken. So again, just because 
the endoscopist sees something else, if the indication is for iron deficiency, they really need to take small bowel biopsies. I think the population that I see this most overlooked in is menstruating women. Again, they come to your practice, they're iron deficient. We tend to blame it on their menstrual cycles and we don't think about celiac disease when really they're the population we should be thinking about it in. So again, if you're sending someone to endoscopy, with the indication being to evaluate for iron deficiency anemia, it really behooves you to ask for small bowel biopsies. What about metabolic bone disease? I already mentioned this is the leading cause of morbidity in these patients, and they have a fracture risk that's significant, two to three times higher than non-celiac patients. And this is due to a combination of either calcium and or vitamin D malabsorption. So again, they can either have osteopenia, osteoporosis, or osteomalacia related to vitamin D. So again, if you're seeing someone who's you know, prematurely, oste prematurely osteoporotic, you should think about why is that and at least have celiac disease in your differential of things to work them up for. In terms of abnormal liver tests, you might see someone in your clinic that you're checking labs for whatever reason and you see isolated elevation of their AST, ALT, or alkaline phosphatase. So if, they, if a celiac patient has an elevated AST or ALT, this could be from autoimmune hepatitis, which is the most common autoimmune condition seen in these uh, folks in terms of liver disease. Again, these patients can be obese and even non-obese patients can get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so that could be the cause. And then a smaller percentage of patients may have a react reactive hepatitis. And some patients will call this, or some providers will call this a celiac liver. You do all the tests for all these other autoimmune conditions, they don't have it. You put them on a gluten-free diet and their liver tests improve. So I don't think the pathophysiology of that is well understood, um, but that, that surely does happen. If they have an isolated alkaline phosphatase elevation, Probably most common, it's going to be from vitamin D malabsorption, so you probably want to consider fractionating it. But you have to think about primary sclerosing cholangitis or primary biliary cirrhosis in these patients. And this is why, again, at Mayo, there was 30 patients over a certain time period that had celiac disease that underwent a liver biopsy at our institution. And of these 30, 19 were found to have an autoimmune cause of their liver disease. Most commonly autoimmune hepatitis, but not far behind is primary sclerosing cholangitis. The interesting thing about this population is you can see here, only 26% of those with an autoimmune associated liver condition actually had any symptoms that they thought were attributable to celiac disease. The other patients who had a non-autoimmune liver condition, and you can see the conditions listed there, interestingly, over 80% of those had GI manifestations or other clear manifestations of celiac disease. So if you have someone with an autoimmune liver condition, you may want to think about celiac disease, especially if they have other, again, dots. They're iron deficient, um, those sorts of things. Dermatitis herpetiformis is the classic rash. This is a highly testable kind of board kind of question, board image they may give you on your recertification exam. So the important thing to know about is this really represents an intestinal sensitivity to gluten. This isn't, you know, this person hasn't been sitting at a table rubbing their elbows on a piece of bread. This is really the skin manifestation of what's going on in their gut. <clears throat> the thing that can be helpful when you're getting the history of this is it's very itchy. These patients will just itch and excoriate these lesions. And the name herpetiformis is derived really because these look herpetic, they're vesicles. By the time they come to you, they've likely excoriated those vesicles to the point where they're just scab-like lesions like this. Typically, it's on extensor surfaces, so elbows, buttocks, often symmetric. Importantly, the far majority of these patients have no GI symptoms, which is surprising because you know, three-fourths of them will have pretty significant villus atrophy if you biopsy their small bowel. So this makes it hard because be the fact that they're asymptomatic from an intestinal standpoint, when you tell them that they really need to go on a gluten-free diet, that can be a hard sell because they may go to a dermatologist who will give them Dapsone, they'll put that on their skin and it will at least heal the lesions. But it's really not preventing the issue that triggered this whole cascade. So these patients really need to be on a gluten-free diet. And if you're going to biopsy to confirm the diagnosis, there's really a classic kind of pathognomonic image here where you see deposits in the dermis. And you really need to take biopsies of both the affected area and, and importantly, the adjacent normal area to help make this diagnosis. 
So getting back to the patient that I started out with, that 34-year-old woman who was 16 weeks pregnant, who had diarrhea, iron deficiency, and a low BMI. So if you were seeing her in your office, what would be the next best step that you would do? Would you check an anti-gliadin IgA antibody, an EGD with small bowel biopsies, schedule a loperamide for her, do a tissue transglutaminase IgA antibody, or check her HLA status? What do people think? All right, I hear a few things. I heard a D. I think it can be individualized, but I think a D is, is probably a good way to go in this case. We'll talk about the fairly lack of utility of gliadin antibodies in practice anymore. Boy, in a pregnant woman, it's hard to convince them to undergo an invasive study if there's non-invasive things you can do instead. I think just giving her low paramide would be overlooking what, what's staring us in the face as a potentially treatable condition that has ramifications for her and her infant if not diagnosed. And HLA status, again, she's 30 to 40% likelihood she's going to have the positive HLA DQ2 or DQ8. So it may not help refine things enough for you. So we'll talk about the studies. But this is what I did in her case. I checked her TTG as a first step. Hers was greater than 200. Normal for our lab at the time was less than 20, so over tenfold elevated. Um, clearly, you know, talking to her about doing an EGD to confirm the diagnosis, I can tell you that when I was 16 weeks pregnant, I probably wouldn't have been convinced to have an EGD performed. So even though it's safe. Um, so we put her on a gluten-free diet. She had a very uneventful pregnancy. Postpartum, then 24 weeks later, her TTG had actually normalized. She wanted to undergo an EGD at that time, and just knowing the rate of the slow healing of the small bowel appropriate in that setting, we did get an EGD, and it showed healing features of celiac disease. So I think we still made the diagnosis, but maybe in a bit of a, of a different order than we might normally do, where a small bowel biopsy should be done right after that serology. So we'll talk more about each elements of that testing, but the important thing is, and again, it gets to that caveat of so many patients are on a gluten-free diet nowadays because they think it's healthy, it makes them feel good, but if you're going to test someone for celiac disease, you really want to make sure they're on a gluten-containing diet first, because if not, the sensitivity of the serologies and even the small bowel biopsies will significantly be affected if they're on a gluten-free diet. So if, some, you know, if someone asks you, boy, I, I, I want to start a gluten-free diet, do you think that's okay, doc, or you know, to their provider, first I think you'd want to ask and make sure they don't have any features of celiac disease that would warrant them being tested. If they don't, you don't need to do testing, and you can tell them that's fine to go on a gluten-free diet. But boy, if they're having diarrhea and all these things, and that's why a gluten-free diet is tempting for them, you may want to test them before they do that because it's going to be very complicated to do testing thereafter. If you have a patient who's willing to go through a gluten challenge because they've put themselves on a gluten-free diet before testing, um, and they're willing to do this, I can tell you most patients aren't, but if, you, if they are willing, this is what you really need to do. And this was a study that just actually came out late 2012 that I think helps outline what you can do for a gluten challenge. You can give a patient two slices of wheat bread a day for two weeks, and already at two weeks, the likelihood that if they have celiac disease that their serologies will become positive is pretty good. It's well over 70%. And so at that two-week mark on a gluten challenge, you can ask them if they're tolerating the gluten challenge. If they're tolerating it fine, the recommendation is have them stay on that gluten challenge six more weeks and then do testing. If at that two-week mark, though, they're miserable, they're stating that they're bloated, they have all these symptoms, it's reasonable to test those patients at that two-week mark because that's probably enough time in those patients that if they're highly symptomatic, their serologies will be positive. So these are the serologies that are, are available nowadays. Uh, we'll start with the anti-gliadin antibody. This has really fallen out of favor in most practices because the sensitivity and specificity are just not up to par with the other serologies. And what we tended to see were a lot of false positives because any kind of mucosal disruption of the gut would lead to a false positive gliadin antibody. So we were chasing down a lot of falsely positive tests. The endomysial antibody is quite good. You can see sensitivity and specificity in the, in the high 90s. The issue with this test is that it's an IgA-based test. It's more expensive than the other serologies, and it's subjective in that it's operator dependent in reading out the result. So it is a good test, but it has those uh, issues with it. 
The tissue transglutaminase antibody comes in both an IgA and an IgG form. You can see the IgA-based assay has a greater than 95% sensitivity and specificity. The IgG-based assay, you can see, has a very, very wide range of sensitivity and specificity. The lower ends of those are really, if you do that test in someone and they're not IgA deficient, the sensitivity and specificity are really, really low. Test characteristics are much better if the person is truly ID, IgA deficient and you do an IgG-based assay. The, the thing with the TTG is this test is less expensive compared to the endomysial. It's, it's, not, it, it's an objective test. It's not operator dependent. So that's why it's largely favored over the endomysial antibody. The only negative of this test is you lose some specificity in someone who has autoimmune disease. So let's say they have autoimmune thyroid disease or autoimmune liver disease. This test may be a, a bit more compromised compared to the other uh, serologies. The deaminated gliad, gliad and peptide is the new serology on the block. It comes in both an IgA and IgG uh, assay. You can see the IgA-based assay, the sensitivity is a bit broad still at this point, but the sensitivity and specificity for the IgG-based assay is greater than 90%. So clearly this is a completely different test than the old gliad and antibodies, much better than that. And it's actually probably equivalent and no, and no different than the tissue transglutaminase antibody. But really the role in using this uh, in our practice now is this is probably the test to use in someone that's IgA deficient, either the TTG IgG or the deaminated IgG. But if you look at the guidelines that have come out on celiac disease, the IgA-based TTG is the endorsed screening test. So that's really what you should be using in your practice if that's available to you. So the question is, when do you biopsy? Well, boy, if you have someone with a compatible symptoms, a high serology, do you need to biopsy them? I think the guidelines would all say yes, you really should. It really allows a confirmation of the diagnosis. It also, what I think is very helpful, is it gives you a baseline so that later on when the patient presents with ongoing or recurrent symptoms, you have a baseline to, to go back and compare to. Because again, once you put them on a gluten-free diet, things really change and it's hard to go back and establish a baseline. Some recent literature in the pediatric uh, population got, and some of those guidelines debate if all kids need a biopsy. Again, young kids putting them through a, a possibly invasive test. And they say in that population, if they have classic features, a serology that's greater than tenfold elevated from normal, you could put them on a gluten-free diet without a biopsy. Well, let's say, so who, who, who does that mean should have a biopsy? Probably anyone with this positive serology, again, before you put them on a diet. I would say that even if they have very strong clinical features, even if their serology is negative, they should have a biopsy because, again, these Serologic tests are not perfect, and you may miss if you don't think about it in someone who has several dots that you're putting together. And again, if someone, as I mentioned before, is referred for iron deficiency, they should have a biopsy. And where do we biopsy? This really needs to be done from the duodenum. You know, patients might say, well, I had a colonoscopy, and I think they biopsied my terminal ileum. Wouldn't that have been enough to look for celiac disease? But if you look, the far majority of patients have either you know, extensive enteropathy with a strong predominance in the duodenum and upper uh, small bowel. Some patients may have it more limited only to the duodenum, no involvement in the jejunum. Very, very small percentage of patients will have it patchy throughout the jejunum without duodenal involvement, but that's rare. So again, we take biopsies from the duodenum and beyond, and we usually take at least four biopsies. Some practices will take six. In terms of the endoscopic findings, these really, to be honest, most of the time an endoscopist is going to go down there, it's going to look quite normal. So again, that shouldn't prevent someone from taking biopsies if that was the indication for the EGD. Sometimes we might be lucky enough to see kind of this, you know, lumpy bumpiness of the mucosa here, the scalloping or nodularity, this mosaic pattern with these cracks in the mucosa, if we see that, boy, we should take biopsies even if it, they weren't requested or indicated because we're likely to find something. But if you look at the yield of these endoscopic findings, the sensitivities are, are really quite terrible. Again, most of the time it's going to be normal. But if you see one of these findings, the yield is very high. So again, worth taking biopsies if they're seen. In terms of the histologic findings, 
We talk about villus atrophy, and so if you look at this lower panel, this looks like the villi have been just shaved off of this small bowel biopsy. But patients can have just partial villus atrophy like you see here. You also see this elongation of the crypts. Usually they're quite shallow, but you can see these crypts come, uh, are very long, longer than the villi. All patients you'll see, and it's hard to see here or appreciate, but they'll have an increase in these intraepithelial lymphocytes, and then they have chronic inflammation in the lamina propria, so kind of a classic description of the histology. This isn't something that anyone really needs to commit to memory in terms of these various marsh classifications, but I think it's very helpful to know that someone could have celiac disease with very few or very minor symptoms. Their serology may be on the low end of normal. Their villi actually may look intact. Their crypts actually look intact. And the only thing that you may see on their histology is increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. And I'll talk in a minute, we, we're seeing that more and more commonly on biopsies and we're not sure what to do with those patients. As patients progress and they have more malabsorptive symptoms, they'll have flattening of their villi, but again, at each stage, they should have some increase in the intraepithelial lymphocytes. So if you don't see that on histology and they only have villus blunting, it really kind of broadens the differential of things you need to think about. And again, this is just kind of a histologic spectrum, just showing you what normal looks like, long finger-like projections. Here they just look a little bit short and stubbier with partial villus atrophy. Here they're almost completely blunted, and here it just, this almost looks like a colon biopsy, completely shaved off, no villi apparent. So this is a concept that's been around for a while that we know that all that flattens a small ball biopsy is not celiac disease, but I think probably the bigger thing that we're faced with nowadays is everything that causes intraepithelial lymphocytes on a biopsy is not celiac disease. Um, certainly you need to think about it if you see that, but some of these other things should go through your mind. The things that are most common either in the literature that we've seen are small bowel bacterial overgrowth can cause increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. NSAIDs can do that. H. pylori can do that, even though you might think oh, that's odd. H. pylori is in the stomach, this is in the small bowel, but clearly that's been associated. A number of these other things are less common, but I'll bring your attention to um, met other medications besides NSAIDs. <clears throat> and late in 2012, a study came out uh, in the Mayo Clinic proceedings about a number of patients who were on Olmosartan or Benicar who had classic histologic features of celiac sprue. So again, if you have a patient who's serologically negative but has biopsies of classic sprue, again, go back to the medication list and review those things. I've talked about HLA, DQ2, and DQ8 uh, several times now and again, how they're, it's very um, apparent that 30 to 40% of us have that, but surely we don't all have celiac disease. So it's a necessary component, but alone is not sufficient. The helpful part of this is that it really gives the negative predictive value of 100%, meaning if you test someone for HLA, DQ2, or DQ8, and they don't have it, you can tell them with pretty high confidence that they do not have celiac disease. So when do we use these in practice? I think there's a, a few times where it may be helpful. Let's say you have someone with just those intraepithelial lymphocytes and the serology is, is either normal or very minimally elevated. Someone with a classic biopsy but negative serologies, you might think about it. Again, one thing that we do in our practice is the person who's already on a gluten-free diet, let's say they're resistant to doing a gluten challenge, you may think about doing it in this case if you're lucky enough that they're negative for HLA DQ2 or DQ8, you can at least reassure them that they don't have celiac disease. They can stay on their diet if it makes them feel good, but at least they don't have celiac disease. And you might be lucky 60 to 70% of the time. A little more challenging what to do in the 30 to 40% of people who will be positive, but that's a role of using it. And then it's probably helpful in certain at or high risk populations, such as those with Down syndrome, do one-time testing of their HLA. If they don't have DQ2 or DQ8, you really don't have to worry about celiac disease in them later on. It probably doesn't have the same utility in terms of testing diabetics or family members because of the genetic relationship in families as well as the HLA associations with other autoimmune conditions. They're more likely to be positive for HLA, DQ2, or DQ8, so it's less helpful in those settings. All right, going on to management. So thinking in your mind, which grain is safe for a patient with newly diagnosed celiac disease? Barley, wheat, rice, rye, or oats? I heard someone over there. 
All right, rice. So of these four things, uh, rice is the one that you could safely tell them to eat. Well, you might say, well, what about oats? I thought that was fine. It probably is. So when you're sitting down with the patient, you've made this diagnosis, it really is can, it's life altering for these patients. You're telling them that they need to completely change their diet, they need to do it for the rest of their life, and they need to be strict on the diet. And you need to tell them to eliminate wheat, rye, and barley. And if you look, it's because all of those really are from the same tribe of grain based on this grain taxonomy. Jo oats are generally safe for most patients with celiac disease. Generally, what we've done in practice in our celiac clinic is for the first year after the diagnosis is made, we'll have them avoid oats. After a year, if they're symptomatically doing well, we'll have them reintroduce it. Some patients in that first year you know, are highly sensitive to oats, either just because it does belong to the same subfamily of grains, but more importantly, there can be a lot of cross-contamination of oats depending on where they were um, milled in a factory. So I think that cross-contamination can be an issue. Probably very, very important, we'll get to this, is to have them see a skilled dietitian. You or I are, are really not well-versed in going over all of the nuances of a diet that a dietitian is really um, skilled to do. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Other things after you've made the diagnosis, you talk about the diet, you send them to a dietitian. Think about checking some labs and baseline vitamins. So I typically check a CBC, and if they're anemic, then go on to check a ferritin, B12, or folate. Check at least an ALT and alkaline phosphatase to look for those other uh, associated liver conditions. Um, some people will check a TSH, calcium, and probably important to check vitamin D. Lots of different guidelines that all differ widely about what other things to check. Some have proposed checking a vitamin A, vitamin E, checking their vitamin K status, copper, zinc. I really only do those depending on the patient's symptoms and if they're low in other things. I don't send off this you know, multi-thousand dollar workup if they're otherwise uh, not deficient on anything else and they're not having features of those deficiencies. Bone density, this varies a little bit in the guidelines as well. Some guidelines will say that all adult patients with celiac disease should have a bone density at baseline. That's what we do in our celiac clinic. Um, some of the European guidelines say to only check it in adult patients if they have some other risk factor for metabolic bone disease. We check it if it's normal. We don't recheck it again unless they have a new kind of risk factor for bone disease. If it's abnormal at, at baseline, then it's worth rechecking in a year or two. Coming back to that, uh, the fact that these patients may be functionally asplenic, and you can see the prevalence there is, is reasonable. 33% up to 76% of these patients are functionally asplenic. So you may want to think about getting, getting them vaccinated for pneumococcus, hemophilus, or Neisseria if they haven't already been vaccinated for those things. So this is probably a, maybe it's a pretty obvious question. Where do you think most patients with celiac disease get their information? In fact, where do patients with any condition get their information? Um, it's, it's not us, and it's most likely going to be the internet. You and I are the same way. We hear something, that's the first place we go to to get information, which is fine, but I think you have to be able to direct patients to the, the appropriate websites. There's a lot of information out there. This was something that Joe Murray let me borrow from his recent talk. This is not how you prescribe a gluten-free diet. You don't want to be this clinician. This was something a patient they didn't seen recently, and this patient was diagnosed by, uh, with celiac disease by a provider, and they were sent this little note in the mail. It says, your biopsy is consistent with celiac sprue. Please follow the appropriate diet with a little brochure in the mail. No dietitian referral, no other testing. So again, this is really inadequate in terms of what these patients need for education and follow-up. So again, you can see here, 71% of these patients get their information from the internet. So important to refer them early. Dietitians usually get, provide them very helpful resources, websites, support groups, books, other resources that are very helpful. It's also important, I think, to, to think about which populations are going to be less compliant. So anyone diagnosed at an older age, you know, they've had a number of years to eat whatever they want, and now you're telling them they're restricted in what they can eat. That's going to be a population of patients that are less likely to be compliant compared to a young child who has their parents regulating their food intake. They're more likely to be compliant long term until they get to their teenage years, they go off to college, they start making their own decisions. You know, lots of their college students are eating pizza and beer, all things that may pose a problem for them. 
People who are detected through family screening, a lot of times they're asymptomatic. It's hard to tell them that they need to completely alter their diet again if they're asymptomatic. And those who are diagnosed because of, let's say, premature osteoporosis or some of these other asymptomatic features, it may be hard to convince them of being on a diet like this. So which of the following items may contain gluten? I can't remember the last time I actually had to lick a postage stamp, so that's probably less applicable nowadays. But Play-Doh, lipstick, toothpaste, all of these things. Anytime there's all of the above, that's always a good, good option, right? So I think that's important because there's a lot of overlooked sources of gluten. For most patients, you know, most patients do well on a gluten-free diet and they become asymptomatic. And you don't need to scrutinize these to a great degree, but especially for the patient with ongoing symptoms, significant malabsorption, you really need to scrutinize these quite heavily. So beer and lagers, um, I think you can reassure them. That's, again, go to Google, put gluten-free beer. There's a ton of them available, so at least you can reassure them. They don't have to give up beer. Any sauces that they put on their food, even at home or at restaurants, often contain gluten, candy, medications. Importantly, you give them calcium, you give them vitamin D. If, if they don't look at the label, those can contain gluten. So again, our patients that come in with refractory symptoms, we have them sit down with our pharmacist to review their medications for gluten. Anything they put in their mouth, toothpaste, mouthwash, communion wafers may have gluten. Things they put around their lips, um, young kids, if they eat Play-Doh, that has gluten in it. And again, glues that are in stamps, envelopes, those sorts of things can contain gluten. So again, things to scrutinize, especially in the patient with ongoing symptoms. The thing that's good is that you can tell most of these patients that they're gonna improve relatively quick, quickly. Two thirds of patients within six months have complete relief of their symptoms if they were symptomatic. And the mean time to improvement is four weeks. So that's pretty quick when they're you know, having diarrhea and uh, unpleasant symptoms. Serologies typically improve very quickly. Most fall by six months. And we'll talk about how that's useful for follow-up but just know that the histology really lags behind. And in adults, it takes a much longer uh, period of time for the small bowel to heal compared to kids. And it can take upwards of even two years for small bowel healing. And for some patients, they may never completely heal, heal their small bowel, even though they're symptomatically improved. So what do we do when we see these patients in follow-up? Well, first we're seeing them at the time of diagnosis like i mentioned we'll send them to a dietitian we'll check a bone density if they're an adult we'll check the labs that i've previously mentioned then typically we'll bring them back at three to six months i usually do it in six months unless they were really strongly symptomatic or, or bothered by symptoms at that first visit see how they're doing symptomatically see if they're improved um, and we'll check a, another serology whichever one was abnormal at baseline in that follow-up Check annual visits thereafter, and at those annual visits, assess symptoms, check their serology, offer them a revisit with the dietitian if they feel like they're struggling with the diet, and then any labs that were abnormal, you're gonna follow up, and again, if their first bone density was abnormal, you might think of checking that again in one to two years. The question is, do you have to repeat biopsies in all of these patients? So I think if they're asymptomatic at presentation, it's gonna be hard to know uh, if they're complying on their diet or, or things have healed. So in those patients you might. Obviously those who have recurrent or persistent symptoms that never improved, you'd rebiopsy. Some have proposed to do rebiopsy all of these patients in one to two years. The guidelines don't endorse that. There's gonna be new celiac guidelines coming out this year. We'll see what those say. Um, but some will do this routinely in their practice after one to two years. But again, not endorsed for all patients at this point. So this is a little bit eye-opening. So this is Olmstead County data down in the Rochester area over a decade of data. And these were all celiac patients that were diagnosed throughout the Mayo Clinic and healthcare system. And so you can see that we were pretty good at sending all new celiacs to a dietitian, 84%, it really should be 100%. Um, in terms of any follow-up appointments, only about half the time did people ask if they were compliant on the diet. Only about a third of the time was a follow-up serology ever checked. And only 4% of the time was a, di a repeat visit with a dietitian ever offered if compliance was an issue. So we clearly have a uh, room to improve. So what is the most likely reason a patient may not respond to a gluten-free diet? Is it that they have microscopic colitis, they have lactase deficiency, 
gluten ingestion, refractory sprue, or lymphoma. C, gluten ingestion. So when this patient comes back to you, they're having recurrent or ongoing symptoms, first you have to go back if the diagnosis wasn't made in your, your institution, get those biopsies and, and have them reviewed to make sure it was consistent. Review the gluten-free diet. Again, gluten contamination, whether it's intentional or inadvertent, makes up a large percentage of the non-responders. And then after those things are done, you'd either repeat small ball biopsies or go to look for other conditions. And these are the things you need to look for. Again, gluten exposure makes up a big piece of this pie, but some of these patients will have irritable bowel syndrome, microscopic colitis, refractory sprue, lactase malabsorption, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and they may even just have an eating disorder. So again, make sure the diagnosis was right, and then it's gluten, gluten, gluten until proven otherwise. And I think you need to ask patients that question in a non-threatening way. I usually, the way I do it is I tell patients, tell me on a scale from 0% compliant to 100% compliant, what number do you think you are over the last year since I've seen you in terms of following the diet? And I think it gives them, makes it feel more open for them rather than just saying, are you strict with the diet, yes or no? I think it gives them some liberty to realize that you're open to a number other than 100% and it leads to some open discussion. Again, lots of conditions that you need to think about and the ones below the line are really the celiac specific ones. So in our 34 year old woman, um, based on her serologies and postpartum, she came uh, with diarrhea six months later. She said she was compliant on the diet, she was believable. Her serologies and biopsies were okay, but this is someone who de developed microscopic colitis. Again, very typical pattern and she did well thereafter with appropriate treatment. So just a few more uh, slides. Refractory sprue is the condition where patients continue to have villus atrophy, persistent symptoms despite a gluten-free diet for a year of time. And there's two varieties, type one, which is where they have, you know, they don't have clonal proliferation of those lymphocytes. These patients do well with some um, immunosuppression of some sort. The type two refractory sprues are those who have some type of clonal expansion of the lymphocytes in their bowel. They have lots of abnormal receptors or surface markers of those lymphocytes. And these are the patients that tend to do poorly, higher likelihood of developing a lymphoma. These patients can develop any form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but a T-cell lymphoma is the one that we worry about. This is fairly specific to celiac disease. Thankfully, it's quite rare. Um, but these patients will present with basically a relapse of their celiac symptoms, and the survival is quite poor. But I think this will scare patients. This is what they'll find on the internet. What you need to do to them is make them, you know, enable them to say, listen, if you're complying on the diet, you really reduce your mort mortality to no different than that of someone in the general population. If they're non-compliant on a diet, their mortality surely is increased compared to the general population both all-cause based on this meta-analysis, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, as well as T-cell lymphoma. So again, tell them that if they're compliant, they can control their destiny in hopefully preventing a lymphoma. Um, in terms of routine screening, it's really not done for mass screening. You can read the pros there. We have good testing and good treatment. It's because that the, the rate of lymphoma is, is so infrequent that there really hasn't been, this has not been associated with significant life years saved. And so that's why it's not been endorsed up till now. Who should you screen, however? Any first degree relative, again, with that one in 10 likelihood, that's quite high. So any first degree relative of someone with celiac disease and siblings have the highest likelihood, so especially look for those. And again, more than half of these family members will be asymptomatic despite severe atrophy. So you still need to test them. The other unique population, of the, if there's a pair of siblings within a family member, you can see even second degree relatives have a high likelihood. So in families with sibling pairs, you actually should screen first and second degree relatives together. So in summary, monosymptomatic or non-classic features are more common than classic celiac disease. So really don't miss the opportunity to diagnose it. We have a ways to go there. A clinical history, supportive serologies and small bowel biopsies can help substantiate the diagnosis. Remember that the gluten-free diet is lifelong, it's challenging, and it is more expensive than a typical diet. So really make sure you've substantiated this diagnosis before putting a patient on this. If they're not responding to the diet, first verify the diagnosis, then check compliance, and then consider those complications that I mentioned. And finally, screening at-risk populations should be considered, but mass screening is yet to be endorsed. That's all I have. Thank you for your time, and I'm open for any questions.
for the at risk, I'm a pediatrician. For the ask, and I'm obviously don't do as well as I should. Um, for the ask, at risk populations, children with Down sy syndrome, Tur uh, Turner syndrome, how often do I check them? Do it at five years, do it again when they're 12, or just do it once? Yeah, that's a good question. That's another reason that mass screening has not been endorsed because we don't know that one time testing is enough. And especially in those. So in the patients, let's say with Downs or Turners, that's where I would check HLA because again, 60 to 70% of the time, you don't have to do any future testing on them ever. If you know in that 30 to 40% of them, they are positive, then you do the serologic study. The question is how often do you do it? Some studies will say, well, should you do it every two to three years? Others will say every five years, obviously sooner if they develop symptoms. I don't think that's been clear cut, but I'd say somewhere between three to five years. Some would say the same thing for type 1 diabetics. How often should you repeat serologic studies on them? Um, again, pick an interval, not well substantiated. It could be three years, it could be five years. But particularly think about it if their glucose control is altered, suddenly becomes altered and you don't have an otherwise good explanation. Have they, have they developed a malabsorption syndrome? Are they now having hypoglycemic episodes? Um, those sorts of things to think about. But you should pick some interval. Um, and do it, you know, every three to five years sooner if they develop symptoms. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Johnson. I'm one of the gastroenterologists here. And excellent review. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I, I'm asking you to go outside the box a little bit. Okay, celiac disease is a subgroup of a larger group of gluten intolerance, which includes wheat allergy and this thing, gluten sensitivity, that nobody knows how to diagnose, but people seem to have it out there. My question isn't so much with that, but rather, as with all diets, there are, as of late, these boutique diets and paleo diets and such that say, wheat is just the worst thing. Wheat is your enemy. It's the devil. Don't eat it. Don't even go close to it. How do you feel about wheat in the general population? I eat wheat, and I feel fine, you know? So <laughs> it's, you know, I think... That's where, if a patient asks me, should I go on a gluten, should I go on a wheat-free diet or gluten-free diet? First, I ask why they're why they're entertaining that. Are, are they having some symptoms, or it's just because of something they've read? Um, you're right, though. It's becoming a fad, and much of California is on a gluten-free diet right now, and I think that's going to continue to expand eastward. I, I don't. I, I'm not adverse to people continuing their gluten-free diet if it makes them feel well. Again, as long as they aren't having symptoms that they treated themselves for, that now you're masking um, in terms of making a diagnosis. I don't tell them to. You know, I don't encourage them to go back on a wheat or gluten-containing diet if they feel good on their diet. So I support what they're doing if it makes them feel good, but I certainly don't go out and endorse that diet for all patients. Um, I think you're right, there's this whole grab bag of people who have gluten sensitivity. The question is, are some of those early patients with celiac disease, you know, those are the patients who are serologically negative, their biopsy is usually negative, maybe they have a little bit of these increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, there may or may not be HLA positivity, um, which is probably, you know, at least if you look different than a wheat allergy, which is you know, kind of an allergic mediated sort of thing where at least you can do specific testing to rule that out. Those symptoms are usually immediate with wheat ingestion. Now you have some celiac patients that say they can tell and some even gluten sensitivity type of patients that say they can tell. Um, but at least, uh, it can be a little tricky, but at least the wheat allergy folks, usually you can sort them out with specific allergy testing. The gluten sensitivity patients are, are the challenging population to to, uh, to work with sometimes because of those beliefs. But like I said, I continue to endorse it if they feel good on it. You talk about patients going to the internet for most information and an experience I share. Is there any site or sites to which you like to direct people so they get good information? Um, there are a number of celiac.org sites. I actually have a few slides I didn't put in this talk, but I can send if, if you have a website that these talks go to with a number of slides that have very good websites that you can send patients to, also some other resources and web links for support groups or where to go to find gluten-free information. So I'd be happy to provide those um, afterwards. I have them on a jump drive here.
thank you.